Hello, everyone. My dogs are barking. <laughs> you get the bark, bark, bark. So much bark. So much bark. So this is episode 650 of season 15. Yes. Probably. I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> but, it is, but it is episode 650 for sure. So tell everyone about this new glorious background that you have. Well, it's not exactly a glorious background. It is it is me sitting out on our patio uh, outside the new studio. So you can actually see the... Uh-oh. He glitched. He totally glitched. I don't know if he knows he glitched. Hello. Hello. Okay. Work or is this, is this terrifying? You glitched for a bit, but you are back, and now we can see everything. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the uh, that's our trees. That's my dirt pile. That's where my <laughs> garden's gonna go. Um, and then, and then sort of over there, and then the side of the of the building. So. I love how green and blue and contrasty it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So um, hopefully uh, this will be the last time people see this. Uh, but who knows? Maybe people will dig it. But the uh, yeah, but but we're like everything is a mess. Everything is just in boxes where, you know, technology is sprayed everywhere. We are uh, sort of shoving aside piles of clothes and stuff to uh, to kind of get everything organized. But. Hopefully, by the time hiatus ends, everything will be a lot more organized and, and ready to go. It's it's awesome. And I'm hoping that by the time hiatus ends, I have heating and cooling. These are the small things. The small yeah. things in very old houses that yeah. sometimes don't work the way one would wish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, again, we're sort of still sort of learning how the new building works and how the heating and the cooling works, but it seems pretty good. Like it's, it's got concrete walls. So it's got a lot of thermal mass that sort of stays relatively cool, even on a really hot day, but we'll see what happens during the winter time. That's, that's when everything will be put to the test. It turns out we have no way to actually cool the building. We can only heat the building. That's standard in, in Canada. Canadians don't really think about how they have to keep their buildings cool I, i'm hoping yeah. that you have like a uh one of those ceiling fans that'll just suck all the air out of your house through the windows or something eventually we will we don't have any fans right now we're, we're gonna get those installed still okay. but, but no i have a window that's that's how we keep things cool in canada is we open a window right. and let the, yeah. let the outside air in so it's the house i grew up in i we didn't have ac until yeah. i was late in high school because didn't need it and then climate change but what we had yeah, was yeah. uh on the second floor of our house there was this giant fan that was on suck that you'd open up all the windows turn on the fan and it would just like pull the outside air through the house and the hot yeah. it would go out the attic and the cool would come into the house and it was glorious it's i mean it's a funny thing like just with climate change that people are like even in canada we're going to start to need air conditioning more and more even in canada when before yeah. it, was just, it was never a thing but uh anyway we should do a show i'm sure people we have lots of questions should. yes yeah. yes all right so uh i am hitting record I La. Know, record. it recorded testing I... testing yes i'm recording i'm going to make myself shorter so that we are similar in height and i'm going to back away so that we are closer in size I'm going to press record over here. All the recording is being recorded. All of it. Okay. All right. Here we go. Oh, and there might be a dump truck showing up partway through this episode. So just I'll stop when the noise of the dump truck arrives. I, I would like to say this is the first interruption by dump truck I have anticipated. <laughs> I, know. I know. Yeah. Uh, they, they're coming about once an hour or so. So it could, but it's been about half an hour. So, uh, Astronomy Cast, episode 650, First Light for JWST. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. 
I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I am doing well. I, I am super excited. This is the last episode of our 15th season, and we finally have data from a telescope that we expected to present the data like 10 years ago. But All right, finally, well, let's get into it. Finally, we have yeah. it. Well, this is it. We are finally going to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. After decades of development, delays, budget creep, the powerful infrared observatory is at its final home at the L2 Lagrange point. Yesterday, at the time that we're recording this, we saw the first scientific images from the telescope. And according to Pamela's rules, we're finally allowed to talk about it. And we will talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And some wind. Hope the wind noise isn't too bad. I Yeah, it's fine, I think. Okay. And we're back. Now I got to apologize if if people hear some like wind noise during this episode. I'm recording this outside uh, while people are working on our studio, so it's gonna. Anyway, hopefully this will be the last time, the first and last <laughs> time you hear this kind of of audio quality. All right, Pamela, I I like I need to like say the words. Does does, does James Webb exist now? Well, James Webb is dead. The Fine, JWST but... is functional and hanging out at Lagrange, too. And it is a so far fully functional space telescope. We did it. We did it. I well, mean, we had nothing yeah. to do with it. Other yeah. people did it. And they should be proud. Yeah, absolutely. So so where were you yesterday, I guess, watching those first images come in? I was in this very chair doing a watch party for twitch.tv slash X, where we watched everything come in together. I uh, did the same thing for President Biden's extraordinarily delayed release of the very first image on Monday. And um, yeah, now I'm happy to finally get to say, okay, I have actually let myself learn things about the mission. And we have stuff to discuss. You've been learning things about the mission this entire time. You just I know, aren't, I know. You just have these rules that you don't that you don't like to be disappointed and talk about missions that haven't delivered science data. And that's fine. That's your rule. <laughs> we will uh we'll we'll give you that. You're the expert. But now, now you've got to play by Fraser's rules. It's true. So um so so what did we see yesterday? So, so yesterday, it started out with a whole lot of, hurrah, it works, and getting to meet and greet a whole lot of people around the world as they talked about this telescope they've been working on building. And then they launched straight into the images. And one of the things that I kindly wish they'd done that we're going to do here today, and for those of you listening on the podcast, all of the images that I'm showing on the YouTube, you can get on our website, astronomycast.com. The thing I wish they had really done is shown us what the state of the art was prior to JWST getting yeah. its happy little mirrors on what it was looking at. So yeah, the, we did that on our on our YouTube, like we did a YouTube episode video yesterday on on my channel and we did yeah. that we just compared each time with the stuff that we had known about previously and and so they started out with smacks 023.3-7327 this is a galaxy cluster that was observed as part of the hubble relics project which was using gravitational lensing by relatively near galaxy clusters to try and identify what are the sources that ionized our universe into being transparent uh, when it reionized. So uh, this is a known massive galaxy cluster. It is about 4 billion years old. It, not years old, sorry. It's about 4 billion light years away. It is known to have a handful of these super cute little gravitational lens background objects in it. And then JWST spent a few hours looking at it and greatly um, 
increased both the resolution and the depth with which we're able to see this field, demonstrating JWST's one-two punch on its predecessors. And with this new image, we're seeing um, kind of endless arcs of these gravitationally lensed galaxies, as well as exceptional detail on the galaxies within the cluster itself. And this is one of those images that leads me both sad that we're not looking directly at like a Hubble deep field where we'd be able to see these extremely distant galaxies without the distortions of gravitational lensing. But at the same time, it's like now we can get data on the merger process in this four billion light year away cluster that we didn't have before. And we get to see in a very short exposure remarkably gravitationally lensed objects. There wasn't a whole lot of science released yesterday, but I am guessing that in the coming weeks and months we are going to get, and JWST saw the furthest, faintest, reddest, most active, yeah all the adjectives galaxy from the early universe that has ever been seen. Yeah, it, I think it was important. People got a little confused, especially on like online, just about what was going on here. Like yeah. this was a 12.5 hour exposure from Webb, which is the equivalent of a three week observation by Hubble. But Hubble never did a three week observation on this object. Correct. And so and so but but it's Essentially, Webb in, in just half a day did a Hubble deep field and it can do them whenever it wants, wherever it wants, all the time. And, and so it hasn't even done its version of the deep field. That, that, that's coming in the future. When and it and, spends three weeks staring at some point in the sky. And it's extraordinarily important to note, this is not a deep field. Hubble deep field images, it it involved finding the darkest, most empty points on the sky possible and pointing Hubble at those absolutely empty to other telescopes parts of the sky. Here, they, they purposely here, they purposefully pointed at a known to be extremely crowded part of the sky. They yeah. knew there was a relatively close galaxy cluster. They're just after the awesome gravitationally lensed objects. All right, we're going to talk about this some more, move on to the next images, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right, what was the next image? So they, they actually didn't go to an image next. They instead went to a spectra of uh, WASP-96b. This is one of two known exoplanets that don't have clouds in their atmosphere. This is a hot Saturn orbiting its star every few days on an orbit that makes Mercury's orbit look huge. Yeah. Now, the reason they looked at this is as the star's light shines through the atmosphere of that hot Saturn of that gas giant, the starlight passes through the atmosphere, allowing us to see what molecules are in that atmosphere absorbing out light. And in this case, one of those molecules happens to be water vapor. So they spotted a ton of water vapor and demonstrated that yes, JWST can indeed take spectra of extrasolar planets atmospheres. And the thing that I really liked about this is that the entire transit took six and a half hours. Yes. And and Webb was able to just watch the whole thing from the beginning of the transit through all the way out to the other side of the transit. And this is this is not something that Hubble can do because no. Hubble is is orbiting around the Earth. And so unless the object is lined up in a way that it can see it for the entire orbit, Hubble can only see it for 45 minutes at a time and then the is blocking its view and it has to go look at something else right and and so you can never get this just continuous observation and so like we're just in the infancy of observing the atmospheres of extrasolar planets it's only been done a couple of times hubble's done it spitzer's done it yeah and not to this level of of sensitivity and and so to be able to see all these separate absorption lines of water to really know what's going on in the upper atmosphere of the planet this is it's groundbreaking 
but I'm sure for a lot of people it, it was underwhelming because this is not what they were expecting. They were hoping to see a little planet with clouds and no. and aliens running around on it. But but no, you just get really Spectra. but yeah, really good confirmation that there's water vapor in the atmosphere yes. of another planet. And Which and that is, is exciting. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and it's in the comparison to Spitzer that you're completely right. This is what we need to be comparing this to. And with Stefan's Quintet, which is the object I personally was most looking forward to, the reason I was super looking forward to it is in the Spitzer image, that sucker has a smiley face. It's a super smiley, smiley face. This, this field of view, which is familiar to most amateur astronomers, has five different galaxies. One of them loves to get cut off on the images. There's a blue one. It's an interloper. It's not actually part of the gravitationally bound group. But this other line of systems uh, includes two that are clearly interacting close together. And, and their cores in, in the Spitzer image appear like little eyeballs and a shockwave they're generating makes a smiley face. And, and in the Spitzer image, we were able to confirm something that we'd seen in radio that Chandra's image, uh, which often gets superimposed on top of a Hubble image, Chandra had seen this blue wall between some of the merging systems. Spitzer saw it as a green wall between the systems. And that wall isn't visible in the optical images like you can take with a backyard telescope. And we've been trying to figure out what the heck that wall is. And I was hoping that JWST could tell us. I was hoping that JWST would have an even better smiley face. And here, the release of the JWST image was nothing I had hoped for, but still very cool. Because yes, it totally saw the wall between the objects. They weren't able to say for certain what kind of shockwave it was yesterday, but what they were able to do instead was say, hey, let's look in detail at that northmost in the image galaxy. And when we do that, we can see jets coming out of the disk of the galaxy that are probably being caused by that galaxy actively feeding as material is sent careening into the core of the galaxy during this merger of so many of the galaxies in this group. And what I what I found really interesting about this image, I mean, Stefan's Quintet, this is, as you said, it's an object you can see with an amateur telescope. It's been known yeah. about for hundreds of years. I've taken pictures of it. It looks really cool. Yeah. Um, but but to to see it with this level of detail, you're seeing four galaxies interact with each other with tidal tails and streams and gas shuttling between the, the galaxies. You're seeing them tearing each other apart and one and material is streaming into this black hole and you're getting these jets. And and this is very rare now for a large cluster of galaxies to be doing this so close to us you know the, yeah. the universe is so much less dense today than it was back in the early history but if you look back to just a few billion not even just a few hundred million years after the big bang you're going to see much more of this and so to find an example that's close gives a really good fingerprint for them when they see these things so much farther away to go oh, okay yeah this is like stefan's quintet but just at the very beginning of the universe and so it's really valuable to be able to see something like this so close but then to be able to compare it to to what the real data i guess the really the, you know what web was designed for is to see the stuff that is just a few hundred million years after the big bang and and it's it's just kind of awesome that we're gonna learn all these details we didn't know. And it, it, it's sad to me that we didn't get enough science out of this yesterday. They went, they took these snapshots, they presented them, went, aren't these gorgeous? We went, yes. And our first episode of our 16th season coming September, 2022 is hopefully going to highlight a ton of science. science. I wish we yeah. had more science. Well, like, so Webb has a, 
has a spectrograph that can do 100 galaxies simultaneously. Yes. So in that image of SMAX, it can it can analyze the spectra, the character, the chemical fingerprints of of 100 galaxies at a time in that image. It can do this. It can do so much science. But I'm sure the way this worked was they gather the data. They did a quick image processing so that we could see it. But now astronomers are going to be spending probably decades in some of these pictures studying all everything that was gathered and these are just five images like my mind is blown at how <laughs> much at how much science is going to be happening from this telescope and we're going to talk about the last two images but it's time for another break and we're back all right what was the next image so so the the next image they gave was actually a um planetary nebula this yes. is the southern uh ring nebula it looks exceedingly similar to the ring nebula next to uh vega and the constellation lyra they're slightly slightly different i'm not sure how you pick one over the other and in the hubble image that we have you can see it's a cool system. It has a binary star in its core, the white dwarf of the binary systems hanging out being little tiny and faint, barely visible. And there's cool detail, but when we switch from that Hubble image over to instead looking at a JWST image, what we see is all of those ring structures are no longer nice smooth rings but are instead these lacy filamentary structures and we start to be able to see how this planetary nebula was exhaled in puffs with a variety of different layers in the system yeah and and that little white dwarf suddenly pops out becoming visible and what i love about this one is one of hubble's key directives one of its raison d'etre was to figure out what the heck is going on with planetary nebula which basically look like really fascinating smudges from the surface of the earth yeah yeah it was and, one of the science goals for hubble and it didn't quite get there. It, it got us further along the path, but there's still a whole lot of we do not know what is going on. This quick image starts to tell us that JWST yeah. is going to provide us a lot of detail to probably initially confuse us a whole lot more, but eventually allow us so much greater of an understanding. And, and again, like what you're seeing is you're seeing these shells of material yes. that were blown out by the star each time it puffed out as a red giant and then collapsed back down and then puffed out and each one threw this shell out into space and the chemical composition of each one of those shells is going to be a little bit different based on this phase that the star was in you're watching the final evolution of this star as it is proceeding to its death and and then astronomers can look at each little piece of this picture and run the story backwards to and then use that to look for other stars to see if they're what phase of their evolution they're in as they're going through their their death throes and could give us a much better sense of when stars are 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 about to die and it's i don't know it's I've, i can't think of like all i can think of are like morbid versions right you're like looking at a rotting corpse well we we are it's like a csi right it's like a csi episode where they're like measuring the which kinds of bugs are eating the, the body but but a star here but, we use what ionization level indicates the temperature of the system so we can measure the cooling but yeah yeah bugs but yeah, ionization yeah, bug, same thing yeah exactly and i also love that bonus that they were able to see the binary star at yes. the heart of this of this nebula and and it so just great. makes me wonder how much of the chaos we see is actually planetary nebula inside of planetary nebula from binary systems like that creating the things that have been confusing us for decades and like one of those big questions right now is like what does the future hold for the sun will we make one of these when the sun dies or yes. was this binary star key in whipping up the material and firing it out into these interesting shells and this is still an, an unsolved mystery we don't know well 
we know that the atmosphere will get puffed off. What we don't know is what shape planetary nebula different yeah. stars will create. And this is going to start to explain all those crazy spirograph shapes. All right, the next one, the final image released. All right, so the final one released was from the Carina Nebula, which is, again, one of these massive uh, nebulae that can be seen uh, easily from the surface of the planet. It's a southern hemisphere object, so go Australia, South America, Africa. You've got, you've got this one. We do not. Um, it's a gorgeous star-forming region, home to the ever-famous Eta Carina, which uh, lives inside the Homunculus Nebula and will hopefully go supernova and be observed by human beings one day. Uh, but JWST can't exactly observe the entire nebula. Um, Spitzer spent a great deal of time back in 2005 peering through this. Spitzer had a 0 0.85 meter mirror. JWST is 6.5 five meters. This yeah. means that it has roughly seven times the resolution working in similar wavelengths. And, uh, well, what it sees, we have a tiny little snapshot and dogs barking. We're going to wait. Okay, the dogs are done. What we have is a little tiny snapshot of the Mystic Mountains. And what we're seeing is an edge of this giant molecular cloud that is collapsing and fragmenting. And as it does, new stars are lighting up. We are seeing a level of detail we've never quite seen before. Mm -hmm. And what I'm really looking forward to is when we have a whole variety of these images of both Carina and the Orion star forming region that will allow us to go through and see just what do the first few million years of star formation look like in these systems. And when you look at that image, like the, the stars at the top of the image are these hot blue white stars, and there's this faint blue nebulosity around them. And then there's this very clear, you call the mountains, this cliff yeah. edge, this dust front where the hot radiation from the stars is blowing away the nebula, piling it up, forming new stars, but also clearing the material away from stars. And this will give us some sense of how star formation begins, but also ends. Yes. When does this material get blown away, starving the stars from any further accretion and any further growth? And it is this give and take that astronomers still don't really understand. And, and you see hundreds of new stars in this image that had never been seen before at different stages of stellar evolution. Again, each one would be its own doctoral thesis, its own research paper, and, it, and we will see them coming. It's, it's really an amazing shot. And the only thing that I have to say left me a little bit confuzzled by, by the JWST image reveal is I was fully expecting them to do something like what Spitzer and uh, some of the other telescopes have done and map the infrared to not the exact colors we would see if we were looking at these regions with an optical telescope. We, we got very used to the reds and greens of Spitzer images and it was gorgeous. And, and yeah. then we're seeing what looks much more like the color palette used for Hubble's Pillars of Creation when we look at this. Yeah. And, and I have to keep reminding myself, well, they just shifted everything into, well, something familiar yeah. and beautiful yeah yeah i mean it's it's purely an aesthetic choice i mean the yeah what 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 jbws2 is really doing is just capturing images at different filters different wavelengths of infrared light right and then they are assembling those different wavelengths and saying this one is red this one is blue and this one is green so that we can see it because we wouldn't be able to see anything like literally if someone you know you know maybe you put your hand on a picture of jwst data then maybe you could feel it but that's about it. You wouldn't be able to see it. It would just look like like a white screen, I guess. Uh, I'd go with dark screen. screen. It would just be a dark screen. Sure, a dark screen. Yeah. yeah. Again, you could only feel it with your hands. You right. could like hold out your hands at arm's length and just warm yourself by the glow of a 
of a JWST image, but they have to turn them into visible light so that we can see them. But yeah, more com more comparisons, more showing how the the how the these images are produced would be really interesting to me, or at least to be able to help explain to other people because that question comes up over and over and over again. But still, that's we got time now. We have time. We'll get there. Yeah. Well, phenomenal. Uh, what a day what a what a week what a decade <laughs> it's incredible <laughs> that we we got here and i think our greatest victory is that now you will name this you will say this telescope we will talk about it we'll talk about the data and as you said when we come back in september we will be all over the data results that have been coming out over the course of the of the summer so thank you pamela Thank you, Fraser. And um, I have to say thank you to all the amazing people out in our audience. Uh, my dogs in the background are also saying thank you. Uh, so thank you from everyone in our household to Felix, Goot, William Andrews, Gold, Andy Kelly, Jeff Collins, Simon Parton, Kellyanne and David Parker, Jeremy Kerwin, Stuart Mills, Rob Cuff, Harold Burdenhagen, Marco Arasi, Matthew Horstman, uh, Daniel Loosley, Philip Walker, Jim Schooler, Scott Beaver, David Gates, Nikki Lynch, Alex Cohen, Rando, the lonely and person, Kinsaya Penflienko, Scott Cohen, Paul L. Hayden, Gregory Singleton, Matthias Hayden, Justin Proctor, Niall Bruce, Disastrina, Jeff Wilson, Cooper, Tim McMacken, uh, Nate Detweiler, Omar Del Riviera, Kenneth Ryan, Alex Rain, Alan Moan. Thank you all, and I hope to see you in office hours, which will continue through the summer. But this is the last episode of season 15. We return in September. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you in two months. <laughs> bye bye. Right. And then they and then saved. We'll save. and today, I'm going to remember to put it in the correct folder. OK, <laughs> saved. Oh, I'm amused, I'm amused that JWST has gone from being the just waiting space telescope to the just wonderful space telescope in chat. That's that good. Is, I like that. That is excellent. Episode 650. Okay. So Broken Symmetry is asking over on Twitch, are we surprised to see in the images that go back furthest in time, galaxies forming sooner than previously believed. We don't know yet. They didn't release enough details for me to say. I am sorry. Yeah, we, I mean, like, like, really, there's no answers in yeah. any of this. Like, there's just, just pretty here pictures. Are images. <laughs> here are images. And we are ooing and aahing at the images. And we are, we are pulling together just little snippets of stuff that NASA told us in its yeah. press conferences and in the in the follow-on stories. And that's it. We don't know anything at all about these images. Very true. Very, very true. Yeah, it's funny. <sighs> so a lot of it is us using our understanding of, of what we're seeing to try to explain it. Yeah. But it is not it is not a lot of official information. And and it does take time and I bet a lot of the researchers are like, look, give us more data first, because they, they literally just took basic snapshots. They, they didn't do the yeah. long duration images that we would normally it's a, expect. They have a year. Yeah. They have one year of exclusive access to the data that they requested on GWST to, yeah. to, to do their, to write their science paper and release it on their journal. And so, you know, would you be okay waiting for one more year? I'm just really hoping that the fact that we saw one of the relic uh, uh, cluster targets as one of the first images means that the relic team is going to be doing a lot of their uh, continued research using JWST because yeah. that team has a really solid foundation to build on to figure out just how was what came before what as the universe reionized? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, even with that 13 hours of, of, of data, those galaxies that are being lensed, 
it's about a 10,000 times improvement in magnification of those background galaxies. So it's as if JWST was 10,000 times more powerful to be able to image those galaxies. Yeah. They've got to be able to find something in that. I, I still, part of me is quite sad that we didn't get an actual deep field where we can see these things non-distorted. Yes. But hopefully that will come. Yes. Yeah, I mean, whenever they want, they can do three weeks of observation. Yeah. I, and that, one of the things that, that's really started to dawn on me in the last couple of, of days I've been doing the, the reporting on this is just how much more efficient and elegant this observatory is compared to anything else that's come before. It can just sit there at the L2 Lagrange point, perfectly balanced in space, staring at one object for as long as it wants. Yeah, Spitzer Someone asked could me, do like, the same thing. Was Spitzer at L2? No, Spitzer was uh, in a, a solar orbit trailing us. So it didn't have the Earth getting in the way because it was in a trailing orbit. It was moving further and further from the Earth all the time. And Fraser has frozen. Oh, I lost you. Sorry. Oh, you're back. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, wait till I get a wired connection. We're actually going to get... Uh, we lost him again. Oh, no. Oh, no. Come back, Fraser. Come back. You can do it. Come on. I'm just going to cheerlead his video on. Oh, man. Ah. <sighs> I think he cursed it by saying he's going to get a wireless connection and, and his, his, or sorry, he's going to get a wired connection and his wireless router was like, I shall get you, I shall pay you, uh, punish you rather. Um, hello, tiny intern. Hello, tiny intern, uh, who just popped into the Twitch chat did the most amazing uh image that is a mashup of mountains and uh the the words are hard and the cosmic uh mountains that were in the uh Carina nebula let me see if i can pull that up to show you um the answer is yes let me just figure out how to get it to appear the best and with the least randomness on my screen while we wait to see if Fraser's coming back. I'm waiting. I am waiting. All right. There we go. Wow, my dogs have thoughts. Wow, we have my dogs have thoughts. Okay, while we wait for Fraser, this is the mashup that Tiny Intern put together and posted up on Twitter and um, with a, a a fair bit of hi you have a redbubble store um she is working to get it posted up on redbubble although there are actually crazies out there who are dmcaing the jwst images it won't let fraser connect okay we have lost fraser so i'm just going to wrap things up um All right, so I don't know what's going on with our share with Fraser, but I'm going to leave you with this beautiful image and just say, um, first of all, go check out Tiny's feed. And if the DMCA monster is defeated, um, you will be able to get this on a shirt. And I know I'm going to get it on a desk mat. Um, and yeah, that's it. That was season 15. We will be back with fewer technical difficulties and more HVAC in September. Go forth, be awesome. Continue to support us on Patreon, please, because this is what pays us to do all of the improvements over the summer. So we will see you on the other side. Be well, be safe. Bye awkward transition trying to find the button